colleagues, since uh, the name of our showcase is Future of Medical Education, I would like to raise a question. I am sure worries many of us. How should medical education respond to digital progress and genomic revolution? Will these two revolutions change medicine? Yes, and the change has already started, but the process is still very slow. And of course, will medical education change? Obviously, the answer is yes. Uh, such new profession as molecular nutrition, IT doctors and many more are expected to appear in nearly future. The main question that we ask today is, should we change anything at, uh, at the undergraduate level of education? Our answer is yes. From 1804 till 1930, Kazan University was an engine of progress for Russian medicine and medical science. Kazan medical professors were the founder of Tomsk and Saratov University. Global changes brought by digital and genomic revolution are one of the main reasons why we create new type of medical school, Institute of Fundamental Medicine and Biology. Uh, in this institute, you see it's just on the left, uh, on slides, uh, future doctors and biologists are studying and working side by side. At the same time, we create uh, and organized a biomedical clusters focused on the development of the interdisciplinarity, combining scientific and educational potential of almost all institute, uh, institutes of Kazan Federal University. Teamwork of specialists in various fields gave us an opportunity to create modern virtual reality medical simulators, which you will see tomorrow. Uh, the hybrid model of biomedical education, by our point of view, fully respond for P medicine concept. You see just on the left. In order to expand this concept and to respond to current challenges of genomic revolution, we think that extra three P's should be added into a new curriculum. Just on the right, you see, 7P. Uh, first, first, it should be point of care. We believe that for development and improvement of medical skills, each and every medical school must have their own market, own university clinic, where students are introduced to new technologies and where new knowledges implement in clinical practice. Second, second is preemptive. Human genome sequencing project lasted more than 10 years. And by the way, Professor Baev, who graduated medical school of Kazan University, was the head of Russian part of human genome project. Today, we need just a few days for full genomic sequencing and analysis. So technology are changing and our biomedical school has adequate capacity to meet these challenges. We have created a unique infrastructure from open lab and core facility yeah, for research and education in the field of genomic and digital technology. In addition, we have established our international center together with Japanese Institute Riken, Cochrane, and Russian-speaking academic community. This means that our teaching staff and students have to be one step ahead and be ready for changes and even to outrun them. They are involved in creating new waves of diagnostic and treatment. And just one example. Uh, everybody knows the story of Angelina Jolie, who had BRCA gene mutation, which means that she had a high risk of breast cancer development. To decrease the risk, she decided to undergo preventive surgery. Genetic test of BRCA gene mutation is widely used all over the world. For example, imagine that a gene we are interested in is written as PEN. Pen. To correct mistake, because this pen can correct mistake in DNA, yeah, in case of Jolie's mutation, it's changed to P-A-N. Uh, sorry, but you see. 
It couldn't correct mistake in DNA. Uh, uh, and this can lead to cancer. Many current diagnostic tools are based on revealing particular letter changing, E to A. However, doctors, researchers, and students from our university, together with our partners, you see our partners and institute, Vadim Gavarun also uh, was partners uh, in this project, uh, we discovered that Tatar women predominantly have other type of mutation in BRCA gene. When N, last letters, change it to T. And in this case, it just will be, you see, fat. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, oh, see, it can be here. <laughs> uh, finally, the most important point of my speech, we strongly believe that medical school should become provider. It's a third P of a new knowledge and new technology and become leaders of translational education. First of all, as I have already mentioned, is digital technology in simulating training built on virtual reality. We have already started to change our curriculum and added new educational and research courses. All medical students learn current research methods in biology and medicine, as well as basic business skills, digital medicine, uh, medicine and etc. What we did, it's only the first changes of our curriculum in the digital and genomic era. From my point of view, the main question raised by the current medical education are, what are the main characteristics of new generation doctors? What should we do not to be left behind digital and genomic progress? And which changes should be implemented in educational technology right now? Uh, I hope that today, in our discussion, we will find answers for some of these questions. Uh, thank you for your attention. And uh, together with THE uh, committee, we discussed how to arrange today, uh, today's event, uh, and decided that it will be better if we first listen to all our speakers, and after that, we will have uh, questions and discussion. So, let the next speaker begin, Sir Malcolm Grant. Presentation. <laughs> so the old technology is prevailing here. Yes. <laughs> so first of all, let me say thank you very much to Times Higher and also to uh, the state, Federal State University of Kazan for the invitation to be present. I should explain that I am today in two capacities. The first is that I am the chairman of the National Health Service for England. And secondly, I was previously the president of University College London, which had the largest biomedical establishment uh, in the United Kingdom. So it's fascinating for me to be able to look across the whole of the spectrum that Andre has just been talking about. But I want to um, refer today to four themes and uh, to try to kick off the discussion that we want to have on the panel. The first is in relation to the current crisis that we have in the provision of doctors and other health professionals within our health system. So, within the National Health Service in England, we have responsibility for the health of 55 million patients. Uh, it is a single universal healthcare system free at the point of clinical need. So we have a problem of securing high quality healthcare for a population at a highly cost-effective rate, we consume about 9.5% of GDP compared to the American 17.8% of GDP. So it's essential all the time to drive efficiency. One of the consequences of that is a sense of burnout, of stress, uh, and even of a rising level of mental ill health amongst our medical profession. Let me give you some data points. 
In 2016, a survey found that in the previous five years, the doctors who had completed their training, their foundation training, and then were choosing to go into specialist um, health provision, fell from 20, 72% to just 50%. So a significant drop in five years from the doctors who had qualified and who wanted to go into specialist training of 70% down to 50%. Of those who were not proceeding, about 13% took a career break. We might expect that a significant proportion of those were women uh, wishing to have families and to come back into the practice of medicine. 13% left the UK altogether. And that is a disaster from the point of view of training the next uh, series of medical professionals, given that the National Health Service is almost the monopoly employer of the doctors who come out of our universities and hospitals. And 22% um, elected to go and work in the UK health system somewhere else. Uh, they might have gone into the military or they might have gone into private health care provision but only 0.6% left the profession altogether. So there is a misalignment between what we are already training our doctors to do and what they expect to do, as opposed to what they then end up doing as they come out at the other end. We also now see that amongst those who are general practitioners in England, and the general practitioner is the foundation stone of medicine in England, a general practitioner is the gateway through which any patient goes in order to see a specialist in a hospital setting. The general practitioners are specialists in, in holistic medicine. But we now know that some 40% of our general practitioners are proposing to retire in the next five years. Burnout, uh, exhaustion, because of the increased throughput of patients, but also because of the complexity of modern disease from being family doctors dealing primarily with children and with women through obstetrics and gynaecology. Much of their workload now is with an elderly population with long-term chronic and complex conditions leading ultimately into palliative care as opposed to curative, uh, which has always been a rewarding part of medicine. Theme two is around the recruitment and retention of doctors. Here we reflect on that first theme. Having got doctors into the profession, we are now investing significantly more into the retention and to the continuing training of doctors, to the mentoring of doctors on the job and their support on the job. My point under this theme is that uh, the future of medical education doesn't stop in medical school. The future of education, as with every one of us, is a lifelong uh, process of learning. So the third theme, I think, is what is the future of medicine? I recall there's an anecdote about the Dean of Yale Medical School in 1930, who stood up at the graduation ceremony of the doctors and said, um, gentlemen, the faculty and I have been discussing your education and we now understand that half of what we taught you was wrong. The trouble is we don't know what half. That is still true today because the advance of medical knowledge and understanding is moving at an even greater pace than in 1930. And many of the things that people of my generation learned as doctors, we now know to be completely wrong. What is the cause of ulcers, for example? Uh, a Nobel Prize had to go to those who discovered that it was a bacterial infection as opposed to related to stress or some other condition. So um, everything is changing and nothing is changing faster than the two facets that Andre Kiasov just mentioned, which are around digitization and genomics. On genomics, we are already in England within the new revolution. We will shortly complete the sequencing of 100,000 human genomes, 100,000 patients within the National Health Service. This is the critical thing. We have set up genomic centres across the whole of England. We have recruited patients with rare diseases and with cancers. With rare diseases, we now have a most profound proof of concept of the power of whole genome sequencing. 
With cancers, we are still developing those insights because of the sheer complexity of cancer. But we know that we are in a position now to better diagnose and to better treat a multiplicity of cancers. So from next month, from the beginning of October, we will be the first country in the world to roll out a genomic medicine service within routine clinical care across the whole population. We will focus initially on rare diseases and within cancer upon sarcomas, upon certain leukemias and blood cancers and on pediatric cancers. We will also now automatically sequence the whole genome of children born with uh, undiagnosed conditions. So we will introduce genomic medicine into neonatal medicine uh, as a profound change in the way in which we conduct medicine. But what is so different about this is that none of our clinicians have been trained in genomic medicine. Clinical genetics has always been your specialty, but it's almost as if genomic medicine can be put into the hands of every specialist practitioner in every specialty and not remain a specialty purely of clinical geneticists. Uh, this culturally is quite transformative within the way in which we do medicine within the NHS. It drives other changes. How do we reliably collect data that is robust? How do we use data? How do we curate data? How do we interrogate data? And we can't do that on a hospital by hospital basis or on a region by regional basis or even on a national basis. We will need to pool data globally in the new area of genomic medicine and allow a clinician who has a sick child in London to look at the genome and the phenotypic history of a child with exactly that genomic variant who lives in Texas or in Kazan uh, or in New Delhi. That is going to be where genomic medicine inevitably must take us for the future. And so I then turn finally to the question, well, what do we do in relation to medical education? Every nation with medical education has had a traditional model. And uh, Professor Kyasov demonstrated that in, that in that brilliant slide in relation to Kazan. But every nation is having to revisit that model because that is not the lived reality of clinicians when they go into practice. There is a big difference between the physiology and the biochemistry and the building blocks of science in medical education. Uh, a big difference even between the study of different organs and their functions in medical education and what happens with patients. The changing climate is also sociological. We now have the phenomenon of Dr. Google, of patients who come to see their doctor already having self-diagnosed by using the internet, uh, with often a better informed and sometimes a, a more hypochondriac approach to their condition. But we know that there is an appetite for people to have access to and to oversee the data relating to their own medical condition and to work cooperatively with the physician who is treating them and to enter into a regime of self-care and self-management, which in turn can be informed by new technologies. We will see an outpouring of technologies. We need a new profession of medicine that is capable of operating at one level as a generalist, but at another level of incorporating and using new technologies as they come through. No doctor had to be trained at medical school on how an MRI machine actually worked, but every doctor needed to be understanding when to use an MRI scan and how to interpret it. And that is how I see the framing of medical education in the future. It's the intelligence to understand the human body assisted by the use of new devices, of new equipment, and, and critically important, of artificial intelligence. We may get into that when we have an opportunity for panel discussion. I hope that I've been able to raise uh, some starting issues for our future discussion. Thank you very much for your time. Uh, thank you very much, Malcolm. And our next speaker, Laura Mandel. So again, thank you very much um, for the um, very flattering invitation to come and speak to you today. Um, so as um, Professor Kjertsov uh, introduced me, I'm primarily interested in the earlier stages 
of medical education. So my focus is going to be slightly different um, to the first presentation, but as you'll see, some of the common themes will emerge um, across um, all of our points today. So if I step right back at the very beginning and ask ourselves, what is the purpose of medical education? Well, we can say that the first thing is, it's to develop the professionals of the future, people, the doctors who will be able to, to, to work as clinicians uh, in the delivery of healthcare. We also need to be able to build resilience in those future professionals. Um, as um, Professor Grant has said, um, actually we have got significant problems in the workforce, um, in healthcare professionals uh, suffering burnout and high degrees of mental ill health. So we have a responsibility to build resilience in our young students, in our young trainees, so that they again then can work effectively um, in the workforce. And probably most importantly, it's about preparing those students, the student doctors, those trainees um, for uncertainty, because of the, it's the only thing we can be, be certain of, actually, is that, you know, that life is full of uncertainties. For the earlier stages of training, of course, the big thing, the big uncertainty that students are challenged with is the actual uncertainty in medicine itself, you know, the uncertainty around a diagnosis. But actually, the big uncertainty um, is about the future, in the future of the profession. So in public health, global health, or as um, Professor Grant just, his parting uh, phrase was artificial intelligence. Clearly that is going to be um, a, a big new trend in the practice of medicine big data and data retrieval and of course machines are always going to be much better at that than than humans but it's what you do with that knowledge that is what sets us apart from machines so that along with the ability to have a human interaction with a patient is what will allow um, the, the success of the, the future of the profession so we recruit in the United Kingdom students at typically at 18 to join uh, the medical profession. So going back to basics in educational theory, these are the pillars of good um, medical education. So medical education needs to be contextual, collaborative and constructive. So I'm just going to leave that idea there for a moment and I'll come back to, to explain what that might mean. So medicine is all about solving problems. So thinking about the process of solving problems involves actually just describing what we're doing when we're solving a problem. The first thing we do is to explore all of the possibilities. And then we need to decide what to do. So those two elements are actually quite different cognitively. To explore the possibilities, we have to think very, very, very broadly. So that's divergent thinking. We have to think of all of the possibilities and exclude those that are possibly right or possibly wrong and then eventually converge on what we believe to be the right approach. But in moving students, typically from secondary education, as is largely the case in the United Kingdom, although in other systems that's different, what has happened actually, how students have been prepared, is that we actually wipe out all of that good stuff, that ability to think broadly, and students are prepared through skill and drill, through very linear thinking and focusing on a single right answer, which goes entirely against the grain of what our future doctors need to be able to do. Because very often there won't be a single right answer. So we need to do something to help students move from that very sort of linear thinking to the kind of thinking that they need to be to be prepared for the to professionals of the future. But the good news is that human beings are wired for learning. Right back from when we're tiny, none of us remember learning to walk or read, learning to drive, we can remember that. And actually, it's all about, it's the same process. We, there's just an increasingly complexity of the skill that we're trying to learn. So, as I said, that's what humans are built for. So coming back to those pillars of PBL or problem-based learning, the learning has to be contextual. The clinical relevance and stage-appropriate clinical experience is absolutely critical. The, you know, that's the, the value of discipline-based medical education has been questionable for a number of years. Collaborative means that there has to be regular, meaningful group working, and that group working needs to be done with a teacher acting as a guide rather than a giver of knowledge. 
and that promotes self-regulation. So what are our responsibilities as educators? Well, the first on this list are what we might expect. You know, we absolutely have an absolute responsibility to our learners of providing high quality learning opportunities. We need to give them a relevant, modern, up-to-date curriculum with high quality teaching and effective support in modern facilities, including simulation, technology enhanced suites and so on. We need to understand our students. That is the most important thing. So the, the first three points are we need to take those for granted. We need to recognise the challenges that they face at their stage of their training. And if we do that, what we will do is we will develop competent and confident learners. So we expect our trainees to be competent, sure. That's what our processes and our programmes are for. They're about training them, giving them knowledge, giving them skill. But they need to have confidence in that knowledge because we don't know what we don't know. And there's a lot that we don't yet know. So what we need to have our students, our doctors who have the skill to embrace those potential uncertainties, those potential breakthroughs um, when, they, when they occur. So how do we do that? What are our t tools available to us? Well, as I said, we need to understand our students. And that means that understanding them right from the very beginning, understand where they're coming from, what their stage is and what they need to promote that confidence. Because if you have confident learners, you have some chance of developing that resilience and that preparation for uncertainty. So in designing your tasks, we need to be able to promote that divergent thinking, that ability to think broadly, to be open to new ideas, and the ability critically to work from first principles. Because, you know, as we've seen, genomic medicine has overtaken um, the, the, the profession and, and people who are using it haven't had that training in it. So we have to prepare our, our future professionals to cope with those potential new um, technologies. That has to be delivered by a strong team of educators who are collaborati collaborating together to deliver um, that mission. Providing regular challenge and feedback again to the students will help um, them build their confidence. So thank you very much. That is all I had. So I will obviously be very, very pleased to take your questions um, when, we, when we get to the end of the panel discussion. Thank you. Thank you. And now I'm inviting Andrew Go. Slides. I could try. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, uh, once again, I also would like to thank the organizers for the opportunity to come here and talk to you a little bit um, about our perspective. Um, and my perspective is, is maybe somewhat lower down on the scale in, in that um, I actually you know, operate as a medical educator. Uh, and I would like to just talk about what, how I see those challenges come from. And in particular, I want to talk about mentoring. I want to talk about mentoring as a possibility, as a way to actually find resolutions to some of these problems that were so elegantly presented by our previous three speakers. Um, a little bit about myself. Um, I, I work at Rutgers University, which is the State University of New Jersey. Uh, I'm in both the pharmacy school and also in the medical school, which is now called the Rutgers Biomedical and Health Sciences Campus. Um, so you know a little bit about Rutgers, so we can relate it to, to what goes on here. Rutgers is actually in some ways um, a, a similar sort of institution in that um, it was founded in 1766, originally as Queen's College, uh, as a Dutch reform uh, ministry education unit. Um, I, I guess that form of education wasn't making much money because it went bankrupt uh, somewhere around the time of the American Re Revolution. Um, and then this man, Colonel Henry Rutgers, gave $5,000 to uh, take over the university and widen its educational purpose. Um, it has now grown into an institution of some 70,000 students, um, conferring about 18,000 degrees a year. Um, and spe specifically within the, um, the, the biomedical health sciences, we have about 7,000, uh, we have uh, about uh, 1,200 medical degree graduates um, each year. So, <clears throat> 
one of the things that's important about Rutgers, and I think is part of our educational system, is that we have 70,000 students. 80% of them come from the state of New Jersey. The purpose as a land-grant university is to educate the people of the state. Um, and though the, there are many out-of-state out applicants and foreign applicants, the purpose ultimately is to do that. And so there's an there's a added burden to provide the practitioners who can actually care for the people as we move forward in the future. There will be many changes coming forward within medical education. Um, in sort of preparation for this talk, I actually had a little poll of my faculty um, and asked them, when does, a, when does a medical graduate become a physician, right? And their answers was during residency or during fellowship. So you can spend a lot of time in medical school acquiring a medical degree, being trained, doing your rotational work, but until you get that point when you're actually being mentored, when somebody is helping you learn into the area of practice that you go, that is the time when you transition just acquiring knowledge into really using knowledge. So the, purpose, the point being that that is mentorship. We may not call it mentorship when we're talking about in a residency situation, but it is. It's the point when you're having direct interactions, when you're asking people to think about things and actually have conversations as they move forward, rather than just simply acquiring knowledge. So why does this present as a challenge for us today? One of the first things is not all our medical graduates actually even want to become physicians. Um, Professor Grant already talked about the number of different places that medical graduates may go. You need a diversity of education that's going to allow them to do that. They need to have fundamental biological scientific knowledge, much as has uh, come through here using the Institute of Fundamental uh, Medicine and Biology. You also, it, at present, if we are taking time to learn the things that you must know to become a physician, to become a doctor, to pass the degree, to pass your, your USMLE or your other board-related exams, you're not really capitalizing on that creative energy that offers in there in younger students. You're not allowing them to use that mind and to develop its ability to become a problem solver, as is required, as been pointed out already. We're sort of generating rote learners, people who can take in a lot of information, regurgitate it very efficiently, but not those that can do that divergent thinking that Dr. Bonham was just talking about. And also, a, a topic that's already been coming up in all of our previous talks, information overload. It is simply not possible to have this kind of information in your own head. Um, and if you want to look at this, one easy way to do it is look at biomedical publications. So this is actually in the last decade. So in the last decade, there were some 2,000 million, 2,000 publications just out of North America, 1,900,000 out of Europe as we run down many lists. But most importantly, think about this number on the side. How are they growing by decade? Even in those high publication areas, we're still growing at about 50% more publications every year. If we look at the areas where you're seeing more developing education in Asia and Eastern Europe and Latin America, this percentage is going up rapidly. There is simply no way that any individual on their own can actually acquire all of this knowledge and hold on to it. And as has been pointed out, we're seeing more of the uh, informed patient coming in. They've looked on Google, they've looked at WebMD, they've looked at this, they've got that information, and they are heavily invested in their own healthcare. So we need physicians, we need doctors who are able to actually look at that information and use it, not the way that was previously done of learn everything. So we, we have a societal perception that the doctor must know best. And so this is what this has kind of forced us into, a, a situation of where we've tried to feed students all of the knowledge. We've tried to give them everything that they can hold on to as they move forward. And now, with the amount of information that is coming and what we're asking and the information challenges that are being presented to our graduates, this is a purely unre unrealistic and, to some extent, unnecessary goal. Information is rapidly accessible. Our students coming in, they are very skilled at using alternative sources to find the information. Um, I would point out that almost none of our medical students buy a textbook anymore. They take everything off the web. They take it all away. Nobody's, you don't go in and see Grey's Anatomy sitting on the shelf anymore. I'm not sure that anybody even has a copy anymore. <laughs> so how are we supposed to meet this challenge as educators? And this is a, a theme that I think has already been presented, and I kind of really want to emphasize it. What we need to generate is the informed thinker, the individual that can use the information, use the resources that are available to them, but then actually be able to process that information, to think about it, to develop it, to do both the divergent and the convergent elements that are required. And as I mentioned before, this needs that you need to be a problem solver. 
If you start thinking about medical practice and what's required, then you must be a problem solver, both innovative but also derivative. You need to know what ways things have been done previously and what ways could be tried and what ways shouldn't be tried. And that means that you need to develop people who are able to be interactive and cooperative. We don't necessarily operate as an individual anymore. We operate as units and teams, both in biomedical science but also in the practice of biomedicine itself. There, is, there are multiple people that you need to inter interact with, people who have specialist knowledge. How do you find that out? How do you network? How do you do the cooperative knowledge that's required? And that is a, is a single skill that we've not traditionally taught in medical school. We need to capitalize on the ability that these students already have to utilize the available resources that are around them so they can find more information and develop it quicker. A principal way that I would like to suggest as part of this to do is, is research. Research is a great way of developing any individual's problem-solving capacity. Expose them to what is done. Expose them to how information is developed, not just how do you acquire it. How do we know about the genome? Where does it even come from? And um, we've had the pushing on the genomics a little bit. And uh, I'd just like to put out that genomics is going to be like a tiny little thing in about five years' time. We're already moving past simple genomics. We actually need to know a transcriptome. We need to know a derivative expressome. We need to know a microbiome. There are so many more ohms coming. There's even a clinical omics journal. So just simply thinking about what's already there is never going to be enough. We need all of those different pieces. If we can expose students to research, all kinds of research, that doesn't necessarily just mean in the laboratory, but also the question in health practice research, also the point of translational research, involving understanding, approaching a problem with an expert within the field, within your medical school, that allows them to develop both these problem-solving skills, but also to read some early direct mentoring that will help them develop their own skills as a problem solver to move forward. So, the thing that I would emphasize is that mentoring needs to come earlier. If we're looking at the minute, what we're saying is we run them through medical school, then they go out into residency, and then they start really getting mentored in how to be a doctor. What we need to do is we need to develop that mentoring idea earlier. And a significant part of this is we need to retrain our faculty. I don't know what it's like for everybody else, but I can tell you for many of my faculty that I work with, you know, it's like, what do you mean they don't like to write down notes on a piece of paper? You know, they don't. Most high school students coming through in the United States coming to college have never written notes. They've always done it on a tablet, a PC, a laptop, a phone even, right? So you need to understand that their active learners, their active learning system is different from the way that you learned. And you need to retrain faculty in how they're going to do that and retrain them in this concept of what they need to do to be able to be an effective mentor. We also need to teach our students what they should expect. This is maybe the hardest part. In some ways, our students come in and they say, okay, tell me, make me a doctor. Well, that's not a very creative way to go about it. Think about what your relationship is. We need those interactive and cooperative elements, so develop them. Talk to your professors, talk to other faculty, talk to senior students. Have an expectation of what you should receive so that you can understand what is not just required of you, pass an exam, but also what is required of your educators, help you become a problem solver and a learner. We also need to create opportunities. It's all very well to say it's nice to have more mentorship and more research and have them involved, but we need to have those spaces. We need to have places that students can be involved in meaningful work. And we need to capitalize on the already present skills in our faculty and our higher level students. This idea and this concept of mentoring moving forward, you can use your senior students to help your junior students, you can set up a system where they can come in between, but also you can use faculty who are maybe not traditionally in the biomedical area. As we pointed out, skills are required, you know, mathematical skills, physics skills. Uh, it, you know, you can learn how to be a problem solver, not necessarily in medicine, but if you learn those practices, you can apply them there. So use the other parts. When you're a large university like Kazan Federal, where you have so many different departments, you can send those students out to learn from other people. So finally, just what are the key elements of mentoring? The first is communication. You need to have communication between students and faculty so they can move forward. You need to define the expectations, understand what is required, understand both by the faculty and the student. We need to have a system of assessment, realizing, understanding what's required. 
I don't know what it's like here, but I can tell you that many medical students in the US suffer because it is the first time they've not been the top of their class. They come in, they work hard, and they're somewhere in the middle, and you're average, and that's okay. And they have to learn that. And so that's a, that understanding of assessment is also important. And we need to foster the independence also, which we mentioned by previous speakers. We need to allow them to say, yes, I can think about this. I can move forward. I can do it. Um, and again, that last one is to provide that opportunity, that space for them to grow. Um, with that, I conclude my remarks and uh, take questions later. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Thank you very much, Andrew. And uh, dear colleagues, you remember I was talking about uh, three additional Ps. And uh, as you mentioned, you see, uh, third Andrew will be speak now. <laughs> Andrei Svistonov. <laughs> Uh, good afternoon, dear colleagues. I would like to use uh, this opportunity to thank uh, the organizers for bringing the important issue of medical education reform for discussion today and for a chance to share our ideas and showcase uh, what we are doing as a uh, session of university to face the challenges of the medicine in the uh, 21st century. Uh, medical education uh, is an area on trans of transformation, and medical schools are actively innovating to prepare new physicians for the emerging new model of value-based care. The questions of skills relevant for medicine in the 21st century and share of the new material in the curriculum are challenging academic medical institutions. Some changes may happen nat naturally and without uh, system-wide reform. Some changes, uh, for, for example, millennials uh, could be more prepared to integrate digital tools into their day-to-day -day work than older generations, because they are comfortable with apps, digital platforms, and online communications. Other changes, such as uh, team-based care, moving away from memorization and embracing a cultural shift toward continuous learning, likely we come from more deliberate curriculum redesign. Medical education has traditionally emphasized uh, two goals, preparing physicians as researchers and training them to provide care. Moving forward, medical education could transition from acute care needs to outcomes-based care, focusing on the complex components of managing health and relationships. Medical schools leaders want to make sure the next generation of doctors has the skills and mindset that jobs of the future will require such as uh, the ability to lead teams effectively, draw insights from data sets and guide patients through treatments, care settings, and payment options. At Session of University, we have adopted a concept of personalized lifelong health management as a research and teaching framework, which is grounded in the recent uh, developments in the emerging areas of biomedicine prevention, digital health, personalized medicine, patient-centered care. Competency-based learning for the next generation professionals uh, who will be competent enough to introduce and promote this concept in health and care sector needs to be delivered under a revised curriculum in the system of continuous medical education. We know well that undergraduate curriculum alone cannot guarantee the ideal doctor for the future. But it lays a solid ground for vision and attitudes in students that link the competencies required from their future doctors to core training. A concept of personalized lifelong health management has brought a pilot on curriculum enhancement at Sitchin of University. Currently, it covers over uh, 400 students in different years in general medicine. The most talented students are trained uh, under the individual tailored curriculum. The idea is to design a well-balanced curriculum that facilitates the sustainable development of competences in medical students and individual, organizational, and societal levels. A six-year undergraduate curriculum in general medicine contains a defined core or major, uh, which is determined by the national standard for medical education and a vision of a central role of the doctor working as a professional within a healthcare team to the highest quality of care and safe practice provided to, even, uh, to every patient. The curriculum is revised in terms of a more generalistic approach based on biomedical and behavioral sciences. 
For each year, managing modern blocks, research and innovation block, lab skills, soft skills blocks, and an English language block constitutes the curriculum as a flexible continuum for ensuring target competences. For different years, we have included minors in health economics, behavioral sciences, translational medicine, preventive medicine, patient-centered care, digital health, soft skills such as communication and listening, leadership, teamwork, entrepreneurship, critical thinking. The major continuum to be informed by the research was enhanced by integrative biology, evidence-based medicine, personalized lifelong health management. To balance upgraded content and total workload of the curriculum with the federal standard for medical education, appropriate assessment procedures were designed to monitor and evaluate the relevance of current learning outcomes to the target competences. OSCE has, be, uh, has become an integral part of assessment at all stages of clinical training. Individual learning uh, trajectories are assisted by a professional navigation app where students can access real-time data and trends in health labor market and choose electives relevant for their future careers. The national health sector and professional community will see their first graduates in 2020. But being actively involved in setting demand for the future health workforce, there is a real instrument to tailor training of the future doctors in cooperation with medical schools to the challenges of the healthcare. Besides a 4,000 beds university hospital, teaching facilities include Institute for Molecular Regenerative Personalized, uh, Translational and Digital Medicine, Leadership and Management in, in, in Healthcare, as well as the Institute for Bionic Technology and Engineering. These uh, are the sites where students in different years can be exposed to multidisciplinary projects and master their research and lab skills hands-on. Even uh, if medical school's curricula change overnight, it would be only be one step toward addressing the skills needed by all the practicing doctors. Curriculum redesign should be supported by the new roles of medical educators. Their ability to model ongoing learning and create learning-friendly environment. The undergraduate program is only the preliminary step in this continuum of medical education that uh, lays down for foundation for future professional life, its coordination with later stages of training is essential. Continuing medical education could be integral to transforming how existing physicians practice medicine. Key competencies need to be identified as outcomes in curriculum planning. They will require a scheme of continuous assessment across a spectrum of lifelong learning centered on trainee. Future plans for the medical undergraduate curriculum should be informed by history through learning from the past. The priority for the future will be to ensure that curriculum content is adaptable to changing needs, not over burdensome to students, and can realistically be delivered in a general clinical setting to the benefit of patients, students, and clinicians. Thank you for attention. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, dear colleagues, now it's uh, part for question and discussion. Everyone can uh, say uh, any ideas, uh, deal with topic of our session, uh, and ask any question to all speakers. Uh, please. What? Uh, ah, yeah, I forgot. Uh, I would Join us, uh, Rector of Kazan Federal University. Greet me, greet him. Uh, thank you, Albert. <laughs> yeah. uh, so, the colleagues, don't hesitate. Uh, really, it's open discussion. Where is microphone? Yeah. No, no, no. I see. Yeah, okay. You can? Yes, uh, thank you, everybody. Uh, let me sit down because the, the chair is very squeaky. <laughs> uh, I, I have the question about, uh, you mentioned that uh, a lot of students uh, are basically not going into the profession because they don't have 
where well, they burn out or they lose the incentive for something. And uh, on the other hand, uh, the medical education is very exclusive at the moment. So very top students can go there. And the students from uh, underrepresented groups uh, cannot get medical education, although they might have very high motivation to become practicing medical doctors. And uh, uh, how do you uh, see this, uh, the problem uh, of exclusiveness, but low conversion rate and uh, inclusiveness? And uh, for example, in UK, uh, the medical education is, uh, you have to pay for that, right? Albert, uh, please uh, mention whom you are asking this question. Uh, uh, Professor uh, Malcolm or Malcolm, everyone? Malcolm, uh, yes, Sir Mark, Malcolm, yes. <laughs> uh, medical education in UK, you have to pay for that, right? But uh, the government is, uh, you said, is almost a, a monopolist for the medical doctors. So maybe uh, making the medical education uh, free uh, and involving more students going into that uh, would increase the conversion rate for the actu actually practicing doctors. As I, as I said, because, or as you said, because the government is the monopolist uh, in both ed education and uh, hiring these doctors. So I think there are at least two questions in there, Albert. If I could start with the first one, which is um, the recruitment of students into medical schools. And I think we have a tension here. Uh, the tension on the one hand is how do we get the smartest students and what are they smart at? Uh, so our traditional model in medical schools in the UK and I suspect also in the US uh, is to recruit the very brightest and the best. And these sometimes are people whose narrowness of focus doesn't suit them well to be practitioners uh, when they go out and, and have to deal with human beings. Uh, so there is quite a tension between academic achievement and the emotional intelligence that a clinician requires. Uh, secondly, part of this also means that um, some of the best educated high school leavers who can become doctors leaves out some of those who have not been to such good high schools but actually have the emotional intelligence. So many of our medical schools nowadays have been recruiting deliberately from different social groups of people who have the potential but may need longer in terms of their education but will become doctors in due course. So that's, that's the first question. Um, and there have been some pioneering schemes by, for example, King's College London, which I think has one of the most interesting schemes. The second question is paying for medical education. So um, we, we've rig figured out that um, it's probably about 250,000 pounds, so let's say about 320,000 euros per student to bring them right through to be fully practicing doctors. So that's a huge investment by the state. Although the government has introduced a requirement that students pay fees, it's on the basis of a repayable loan, uh, so that as the student starts to earn, so the loan gets paid down in theory, and so uh, the student does not carry a, a lifetime of debt. And if they come and work in the National Health Service, then that pay down occurs within the next five or six years. Uh, so in theory, there is no impediment to people coming to study to be doctors by virtue of incurring large debt. Uh, but in reality, there is a psychological effect. There's one additional component, though, which we've not touched upon, and perhaps I should bring out now, is that doctors are not the only deliverers of health care. Uh, we have nurses, we have pharmacists, we have physiotherapists, occupational therapists, psychologists. We have a whole array of health professionals who are part of the team uh, to which Andrew and Laura both referred. And for those, um, the entry requirements are different, uh, the training requirements are different. But Ultimately, what we trust that they will do is work both in support and also in close collaboration with those who we call doctors. We're starting to see some of those silos of knowledge, those, those, those channels of experience erode, and a much more joined-up approach being taken from different trained, differently trained professionals. 
into the provision of a comprehensive holistic model of healthcare. The other silo, I have to say, is um, within specialties in our hospitals, between hospitals and primary care, between mental health, physical health, and social care uh, across a community. And um, I think the future of healthcare in a digitally enabled world will see many of those silos also have to be dissolved and for much more cross-working across all of the specialties. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, and uh, thank you our technician group, because uh, now you can see all speakers again, and you can ask every, uh, everyone, uh, or maybe some discussion. Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. My name is Denis Butnaro from Sechenov University, Moscow. I'd like to address my question to Andrew Goh, related to uh, tutorship or rela related to... Uh, Mentorship, mentor, mentorship uh, yeah. with medical students. So uh, I'd like to ask, uh, what do you think about the proportion, proportion about mentors and medical students? Because uh, now we know that uh, in, in, in this time, the number of uh, medical students is continuously increasing. And uh, it uh, could be a gap between the number of uh, um, of uh, physicians, on, of researchers, and big number of students. And for example, in our university we have more than 15,000 students. And uh, what, uh, what could be the appropriate number of uh, tutors for them? Uh, or should we make a special area for b uh, b best students and uh, to implement this uh, uh, approach uh, for only for best students? Uh, so. Maybe two questions in one. Thank you. Or maybe can I add also? Or maybe who uh, who uh, could be a tutors? So who I, I think, and how many? So, so I think the proportion. There's, so there's there's two parts to that. Um, I think um, you know the question of, of of which students. I mean, ultimately, you really want it to be all of your students, right? I mean, the idea of, of of having more involved mentorship is something that should be applicable to every one of them as they come forward. Um, the, the question on, on, on ratio also is probably somewhat variable on depending who you're dealing with. So I, I'll start with myself as a simple example, right? So, so my job is to be both a researcher and educator. So I have a laboratory that's actively running with active researchers involved. At any one time, it's relatively easy for me to take on anywhere up to five medical students in research projects to work with uh, other PhD students or postdoctorals or junior faculty and to move through and get some training and mentorship both directly from myself, but also from the people in the laboratory is becoming part of that team. That's not so easy for uh, you know, an actual sort of clinical practicing rheumatologist. You know, they've got busy time, they don't really want to be spending a lot of time, and neither can they. And if they can't give the time, it's not worth doing it, right? So it's got to be something where there's co coercive projects. One of the things that's being pushed more and more in the United States is to move away from the independent investigator and to move towards the research team. And so when you have a research team, you have more opportunity and more availability. And, and then I think one needs to be somewhat slightly creative about who does this mentoring. Because the mentoring is about becoming a team player, about acquiring the information, about how do you do the problem solving. It doesn't necessarily have to be in the pure discipline of medicine. And I'll give you an example of one of my former students, who's now a consultant anesthesiologist at Columbia, when he came through. Um, He's a mathematician. I mean, this kid, when he walked in the door, you knew he was a mathematician, you know? Sometimes you can spot them, right? You know, he came in, and what did he do? He developed a model on airflow, and he did a whole thing with a mathematician, on, on a mathematician and a physicist, actually, with two groups, and he learned this whole thing about how to do airflow in the lung and branching involved. So you can take other parts of your university that are not necessarily directly in your medical faculty and help them be mentored in learning, as, to, mentored as a learner, right? Not so much actually as a direct physician, you're still going to have residency uh, component for that. But if you started that process earlier on, you, one needs to be a little bit creative and move forward with, as thinking about this. There's one other significant aspect that's different about the US system, um, which is that most of our students are already graduates. So they have a bachelor's degree and many of them have, have a discipline they're already interested in. And often it's, uh, as I was talking to Professor Grant before, it's not always you know, a, a biomedical one. You know, it might be a history major. You know, it, it's not impossible for someone to do the history of medical practice. 
How was it delivered earlier? How has it changed? What have been the effects of that change? Again, you're becoming a problem solver inquiring and information. I know that's a hand wavy answer to your question, and I think the answer is it varies how many. Your goal should be every one. You probably should start with the best and work your way down. <laughs> um, and that's probably the way that I would think about it. You know, always you need to know what you're striving for to know what you're willing to accept along the way. Thank you very much, Andrew. And any questions? Oh, yeah, really? Yeah, Professor Zgenshin. Thank you very much, dear colleagues, for your excellent presentations. Uh, I just picked two key words from Laura's presentation. One is uncertainty, and the next one is confident learner. So may I ask all of you if you have any cases like uh, to advise us how to overcome this uncertainty as the major challenge in medical education and develop the confident learners. Uh, so if, if uh, coming to the process of education, not the monetary part of it or political part of it, so the process. Uh, and just triggering because I'm Cochrane, uh, do Cochrane reviews could help a little bit in overcoming this major challenge and bringing sort of value-based approach to medical education. It's Thank also not much. only one question. Yeah. <laughs> 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 <That's>, uh, <laughs> um, th well, I'll start. Um, and I, I'm afraid I'm also going to give a, a slightly hand-wavy answer to your question, actually, because actually, although I think we've pinpointed exactly the problem that we're trying to solve, I don't think we actually have a proven solution to actually achieve what we're trying to do. I think what, you know, what we've, what we've tried to implement in, in certainly our recent curriculum review and overhaul is that idea that the student needs to be at the center of their own learning, that the teacher should not be a giver of knowledge. Actually, they're there to support them in getting their own information for themselves. And again, we've all kind of said many of the same things in the same way. The students will find information for themselves and they will discuss things with their tutors. And yes, they will... Um, you know, find some information that's of high quality and they'll find some information that's of poor quality. And But that's good because actually learning the difference between what is high quality and low quality information. You can behind the scenes orchestrate actually how students, you know, encounter information. So we've taken the approach that all of our learning resources are produced digitally. Um, and we effectively provide a framework in which we will embed, for example, um, suggested reading, um, which um, includes things like Cochrane Reviews, um, digital textbooks. So in other words, we to try and give some scaffold, particularly in the early stages, um, to, to help them then to learn to sort of titrate what is high quality, what's what's believable and, and what isn't um and but i really do think that the, the key is in encouraging them to work together because everybody in the in the team in the early stages they're all at the same uh, stage but later as they go through training they'll be working with student nurses student physiotherapists student pharmacists and everyone can learn together so it's actually promoting those soft skills again which we've we've heard about is i think the way forward thank you Thank you very much. And uh, dear colleagues, do you have any questions, any additional questions? Yeah, well, yeah. Thank you for your presentation. I have probably the question uh, for all. Um, uh, I'm a practice, so I'm not so deeply involved in the education process, but uh, probably three years ago, I tried to translate some innovation to the real hospital. And there were and there are a lot of problems connected with the specific knowledge in our modern doctors. The first question is, uh, probably somebody plan to introduce a new profession in the medical area, like, for example, medical bioinformatician mm -hmm. or medical embryologist based on the CRISPR or other editing genome or something like that. This is the first question. And second question, how to overcome the translation problems? 
because if I'm not a futurologist, so if you look, for example, for next five years, this is a period when the first stage students accepted the diploma, what it should be. Thank you. Uh, it's a question for everyone, and I think yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, it's, uh, if, if, yeah. Uh, Andrei Alexeyevich said already that they choose a talent uh, students and organize it like special curriculum, yeah? Yeah. Uh, I was talking that we have to choose, uh, we have to change uh, whole curriculum and including whole curriculum in undergraduate level. In undergraduate level, new knowledges and new techniques which will be used in future in uh, practical medicine. Yeah, uh, but how we can do it? Uh, maybe we will ask also uh, Tatiana Vladimirovna, uh, because together with uh, Ministry of Healthcare uh, and uh, Department of uh, Education, only together we can uh, solve this problem. Uh, and Andrei Alexeyevich. Uh, uh, as we well uh, know that uh, uh, trend analysis uh, uh, reveal that uh, physician in 2020 uh, must be competent in uh, many competences and uh, data, uh, data technology and innovation driven and agile and soft skills and so on and so on and um, uh, all these roles of uh, physician future I think uh, are well covered by uh, T-shaped uh, professional model, uh, which combines uh, mm, depth as uh, uh, pro problem solving uh, skills and breadth uh, as uh, soft skills uh, and some minors uh, that uh, provided understanding uh, to uh, work uh, physician in future as uh, leaders and members in interprofessional teams. Uh, and uh, I, I think uh, it is a v very nice uh, model to, uh, to create a uh, curriculum uh, for, uh, uh, to answer any challenge and any, any tasks uh, for, 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 for us and for, uh, the, 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 for task of day, yes. Yeah. And it's very difficult to compare mm. our uh, medical education and, for instance, United States medical education, because uh. Uh, uh, medical education in United States is after bachelor. And right. they go, uh, uh, yeah. Yeah, and of course, yeah. But, so, and, and maybe I'll just sort of move to a little focus of what you said. You talked about the difficulty of translating an idea into medical practice, right? And I think that is a, is, a, is a great example of where we actually do need to move the ability to learn as more important than the ability to know. So, you know, if we think about that, 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 that chart, that vector you showed us of the change in the university as it goes on, you know, educational practice for the, for, well, actually across the university, but specifically in medical education, didn't really change over like 100 odd years. You know, we come in, learn anatomy, this, this, this. You learn it, you come out. What, you, what we're looking at now is, you know, we have a genomic revolution, we're going to have all these other omic revolutions coming on, many of which we haven't even thought of yet. So where you need to be training your people is the ability to go and find the help. Uh, maybe this is the T-shape, right? You know, the, the, where do you go to find the help? If you need help in understanding a microbiome, then you need to find the bacteriologist who understands the difference between this bacterium and this bacterium and why you want to do it, how you can process on 16 sRNA versus non-16 sRNA, you know, because you're not going to learn that. Much like I would challenge almost any physician to actually know how the MRI properly works, right? You know, nobody actually really understands how the MRI works, but the physicist does, right? You know, but they will, can take that information. So how do you slot in and take those other information? And that when you're in that translational field, there's a chance to really sort of learn. You know the medical practice. What you don't know is how to adapt this new idea or what's a limitation for it. And then your information back to the you know, original fundamental scientist and their information back to you, that information exchange moves you both forward. So, 
So, I, I think that probably would depend on the fit. I mean, I think it, we're, we are at the point where I think you probably do need people who are specifically trained in informatics, mm -hmm. right? In informatics is medical, medical informatics. Yeah. It's a unique yeah. challenge. Yeah. To be medical informatic, informatic in, in Russia, for example. Ah, okay. If you are a chemist if, or, and prepare, for example, MRM experiments in proteomics just to measure concentration of medically orientated proteins, it's not allowed in Russia. So, first of all, you should be a doctor. And only then you should be familiar with the modern mass spectrometers. Yeah. It means strongly that we can add and use yeah. speciality in our education. Obviously, Otherwise, we have no chance. Yeah, I think, so I, I would suggest you do need more flexibility. I would say that that sort of flexibility is, is coming in more, even in the United States. What we're seeing many, many more times now is that our MD students don't just take an MD degree. They'll also be an MD and an MPH. They'll do a yes. public health degree. They'll do an MD, um, they might even do an MD and an MBA because they're going to be more interested in health and economic environment. And so the different aspects, they're getting more extra training in. Okay. Uh, do you have some addition? No, I've got a question for my uh, colleagues, okay. but um, we take more okay. questions from the floor okay. first, maybe. Uh, and can I pass your question to uh, Tatiana Vladimirovna? Uh, uh, because she's responsible for medical education, that maybe will be some ideas about this. Вадим, ну я думаю, что в 2020 году вы получите точно такого же специалиста, как получаете его сейчас. В том случае, если вы не придете к профессору Свистунову где-то через годик или через два и не оставите ему специальный заказ на те компетенции специалистов, которые нужны для масс-спектрометров и другой техники для вашей работы, и, как сказали наши коллеги, не станете наставником для того самого специалиста, которого вы получите готовым не только по базовым компетенциям, но и по э, гибким навыкам, по soft skills, которые будут соответствовать тому месту работы, которое вы ему можете предложить. Сегодня я бы разделил систему образования на два больших сегмента. Это сегмент базовый, который обеспечивает практическое здравоохранение. И здесь много звучало э, предложений, э, фактов, которые коллеги реализуют у себя, и Андрей Алексеевич э, говорил о том, что мы большую часть уже реализуем на территории всего вузовского медицинского пространства России, но э, ваш вопрос лежит уже в плоскости более глубоких знаний и э, более адресной подготовки специалистов. Поэтому я думаю, что медицинское образование всегда будет на каком-то этапе делиться на эти два сегмента. Другой вопрос, что в получении базовых навыков, наверное, тоже возникла необходимость их изменений, потому что то, что рассказывали вы, Андрей, ведет к чему? Мы оставляем всю базу знаний, которая была у студентов, и добавляем им дополнительные знания, которые позволяют им э, адекватно реагировать на происходящие события. То есть мы увеличиваем нагрузку, при том, что мы практически не даем им возможности развиваться самостоятельно, развивать навыки проектного управления, самостоятельного формирования будущего и своей жизни. И поэтому, конечно, здесь однозначно, используя новые современные тренды и технологии, необходимо перемещать часть базового образовательного процесса на ага. дистанционный сегмент, понимая, что студенты-медики в России, как я и надеюсь в большинстве стран, это одни из самых прогрессивных студентов, с наиболее высокими академическими показаниями, которые заканчивают школу. И если они не способны перемещать как бы, некий сегмент образования в свое самообразование, то в этом случае мы не сможем сформировать из них профессионалов, которые делают наше завтрашнее будущее. Без сомнения, я абсолютно согласна со всеми а, ораторами. Будущее в перекрестии различных компетенций вне жестких специализаций. Это междисциплинарный подход и формирование нового врача, даже с базовыми компетенциями и навыками. Это те задачи, которые перед нами в нашей стране уже 
поставленные 204 указом президента, и которые нам всем с вами предстоит решать, как в изолированном блоке здравоохранения в рамках национального проекта, так и в изолированном блоке образования. Те шаги, которые мы э, совместно с Мальковым прошли в рамках 5 ТОП-100, многому нас научили. Я встречалась с ним на площадке экспертной оценки наших вузов в Москве. И я надеюсь, что здравоохранение и образование, оно не имеет границ, оно вне политики, поскольку самая главная задача наша – это благосостояние всего земного шара, всего населения нашей планеты. И я хотела бы поблагодарить вас за то, что вы делитесь своими наработками и навыками, отвечаете на вопросы. Я думаю, что вне официальной площадки будет большая заинтересованность, более откровенные дебаты. И, соответственно, призываю все сообщество, вузовское, образовательное, тренды все понятны, но решения, коллеги, все равно будут индивидуальны, потому что образование и в рамках непрерывного образования становится более персонифицированным, так же, как и медицина. Спасибо. Okay. Thank you very much. And uh, you see, it's, it, it's very good that uh, Tatiana Semenova joined us today because it really was speech, uh, like uh, common speech about <laughs> what we have to discuss. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I am looking uh, just on timer and really we have to finish our uh, session uh, and continue uh, according by, uh, by our schedule. Uh, look. Uh, uh, dear colleagues, you see, now it should be tour uh, in Institute of Fundamental Medicine and Biology. Of course, we uh, can divide into two groups. Uh, and uh, first, our decision was that uh, one groups in one part and then change it. Uh, but uh, listen, please, uh, we can do divide into two group. One English speaking group and other Russian-speaking group. Uh, be, no, we can do two English-speaking group. However, uh, is it okay if it will be English-speaking and Russian-speaking group? Yeah? Okay. And first of all, English-speaking people uh, should join the Dina, Dina Ivan. Uh, please pick up <laughs> English-speaking. 